Good morning, church. I have missed you. It is so good to see you. I, I, I got to tell you, I turned around and I'm looking around. I'm seeing people I have never met before that are here today. And I am just so excited that you're here. And I want to thank you for being here. Those of you who are here today, you make me so happy. What can I say? Just seeing you and being able to preach to you has just been such a blessing. I want to welcome those of you who are online. I don't want you to be offended. You like that? Because we love you and we appreciate what you're doing. And I want to say to you, those of you who are watching online, if you're watching online for health concerns, you're watching online because of the health concerns of somebody you love, we want you to continue to do that. We want you to be safe, we want you to feel safe, and we want you to know that we appreciate you watching us online. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother Harper was here last week. He spoke for us, and we should be uh, having several people from the Southside Church of Christ watching us today online as, as a group, and uh, we want to welcome them and thank them for being here. Uh, it's just been awesome to uh, have a connection with them and, and have him here last week. Uh, Tim spoke two weeks ago. Brother Harper spoke uh, a week ago, and I, I want to kind of explain where I was when Tim spoke. I was actually out in Idaho. I, I was at a seminar on discipleship that I've been wanting to go to. What was really neat about that is that seminar was actually in the same town where my older son lives in Idaho. You see how I worked that out? And my younger son flew in, and we got to have a great time together, the three of us. Uh, we were building a room for my older son at his house, and we just had a grand time together and just enjoyed every minute of being out there in Idaho. Uh, the first couple of days, it was hot. It, it got up into the 80s up there. <laughs> the last couple of days that I was there, it topped out about 70, okay? So I, I had to wear a jacket in the morning. It was rough, but I was able to do it. Uh, it, it's just, it was just great being up there, and it's just beautiful country up there. And, and the seminar I went to was just absolutely amazing. I enjoyed every minute of it. It was 16 hours in a small group setting with other preachers and other church leaders, and it was a phenomenal time for me. I came back from that just rested and rejoicing and just rejuvenated because of it. And I'm looking forward over the next uh, several months sharing some of that with you and spending some more time. I'm actually going to be joining an, a Zoom group that's going to be meeting every other month uh, as a part of that seminar. It was just that outstanding. And I'm looking forward to maybe uh, Tim and, and Jesse and others going to that same seminar at some point in the future. But one of the things that happened while I was at the seminar, they had us in a small group, and of course it's a bunch of preachers, and you know how preachers are when they get together. They, they just they tell dumb jokes, and they act like they're perfect, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you say, well, how big is your church? <laughs> Bigger than yours. <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of the thing they do. But what they did is they were breaking us down a little bit, and they were trying to get to be real and, and so they, they were doing several exercises to get us to know each other and everything and one of the things they said is right at this very moment when you think of your church what do you think of what comes to mind and one of the the guys said aggravating <laughs> and, and another one said tiring and then they got to me and I said, they are my glory and my joy. <laughs> That's not the reaction I got, John. <laughs> the reaction I got was, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, every Sunday I get up and I tell those people, have I told you lately that I love you? And the reason why I do that is because I do love you. 
I was not making it up when I said, you are my glory and my joy. I know there's going to come a day when we're going to be in heaven, and I'm going to be able to look around heaven and run into you folks and see you folks in heaven, and, and then we'll have that grand reunion, and we'll see each other, and I'll be able to go to God and say, look, God, these are my people. They're part of my family, and we did life together. And that's the reason why you're my joy. And you wonder, well, how did you come up with that? Well, Paul said the same thing in 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 20 about the church in Thessalonica. So I feel like I can say the same thing about you. And I want you to know that even though I wasn't here that week, I missed you and I prayed for you. We, we, you saw that Joel came up with, with a cool video to introduce my sermon today, a short clip, but Scarlett Jones actually produced the uh, video clip before Little Lambs, and then Joel and I worked together to produce another video clip uh, that was on forgiveness before this, and it kind of ties in with this lesson. And I just want to say thank you to Joel, thank you to Scarlett, thank you for all the people that are working back in the back. Uh, doing the live stream, doing the online services, all of those things that are going on back there. You know, the only time they get any recognition is when something goes bad. I, I don't think any of y'all have ever called and said, hey, it went well today, but let the, let the service cut out for a few minutes. The phones blow up and all this kind of stuff like the world's coming to an end. But just thank you guys back there. Will you, will you guys stand up and let us give you some love? And, and for those of you, and, and I'm sorry, this is a long introduction, but I have a lot to tell you, so just hang on for a few minutes, okay? Uh, I, for those of you who are not here, I want you to know what's going on. We come in through the doors, we're wearing masks, and after we wear our masks, we come find our seats, and then we take our mask off and we sing. We've got shoes uh, approximately six feet and two inches apart. I think that's what Glenn set them up at. Um, but anyway, they're just about six feet apart, and we're, we're taking our masks off to sing and all those kinds of things, just so you know what's going on here. Uh, we're starting to get pretty crowded, but we've always got room for more, and if you want to come and worship with us in person, you are welcome to do so, and uh, we, we would love to have you, and we want you to be here, but I, I wanted people to know, and then uh, we don't pass communion out like we used to with the trays. We pass them out at the beginning with gloves and mask and all that kind of stuff and we give you your attendance card and then when services are over we let people come down we got two baskets here for contributions and attendance cards and you can do those and then walk out and leave and I, I don't know for the most part I feel pretty safe here and I'm but you know I, I don't know anything anyway so it's okay but uh, we're, we're having a good time being here last week brother Harper did an amazing job of taking a real life experience of his and he called the lesson the offender and I love the way that he started out with that because he started out saying are your deacons here are your elders here the ministers are all here everybody's here because I'm going to name the offender and he went through the lesson and at the end of the lesson he told the story of his mother and his sister and his uh, two nieces and nephew being killed. And talking about that story and sharing that, and he'd shared that with me before, and it was just an amazing story about how he had forgiveness and how he could forgive that person after that person had taken so much from him. And at the end of the lesson, he said, I am the offender. And, and I just thought that is so cool because so many times we don't really see ourselves as the offender. Most of the time we'll see ourselves as the offended. How many of y'all have noticed that people are a little more offended these days than they used to be? Okay, so it's not just me. I, I, was, 
I was in Lowe's, and, and there was this cute little girl. She had wearing a mask, just bubbly kind of girl, and, and she had a name tag on, and it was a name I'd never heard before. I'm not going to call out her name because if she's watching, I don't want her to be offended. <laughs> but but I, I, I was talking about her name, and I was kind of, you know, asking, hey, how did you get that name? That's, that's interesting to me, you know, because people have these odd names and there's usually a story behind it, you know? You, you need to know the story behind your name. I, I learned the story behind my name and it's made a lot of sense to me as to why my dad didn't like me. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but finding out the names and finding out people's heritage and getting interested, in, that's the way I connect with people. And this young girl, it was her first day, and they were showing her how to cast register and all and I'm being me I don't know how to be anybody else and I'm just asking some questions and say is this your first day yeah 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 I said well tell me about your name and uh, the other guy's trying to teach her something and I'm interrupting it and he's getting frustrated but it's okay because I'm a customer he can't yell at me <laughs> and so I'm talking about her name and all and she tells me about it and, and I ask her a couple questions and all and I you know what, that is really a cute name for a cute girl. And she looked at me deadpan serious and said, I'm underage, you can't talk to me that way. And that's exactly what I did. What? What? And then all of a sudden, I just busted out laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And then she realized how stupid it sounded what she said. And she started laughing. Well, since then, I've seen her twice since then. Every time she sees me, she's happy to see me. So it's all good. But I have noticed that because of the pandemic, that people are finding themselves getting a little more offended. I've also noticed because of what's going on with racism and the cultural divide that's going on in the world that a lot more people are, are being offended. As a matter of fact, just, just by a show of hands, how many of you have been offended lately by some political ad? How, how many of you have gotten a call and been offended because you didn't want to hear what they had to say about politics? All of us in here at one time or another have been offended but here's the other thing. How many of us in here have offended others? Jeff Stevenson, he is the king of the offenders. <laughs> <laughs> and he's proud of it. That's what bothers me. Some of you don't realize you're offending others. Some of you are got on Facebook and you're talking about your political alliances and your affiliations and you're alienating the other half of the church with what you're putting out there. And you don't even care. Some of you are saying things to people that are just not right and you're offending them. I have offended more people in the last month than I have in the last year. And it's not been intentional. I'm just telling you, it's not been intentional. I love the folks that are here that I have offended by something I said or something that did. They've reached out to me and they've said, hey, Neil, what you did offended me. And it bothered me, and it gave me a chance to step back and look. And, and first of all, I didn't intend to. I don't intend to offend people. But what I do intend to do is if I do intend, it offend you, I tend to make it right. And I apologize, and I make sure that we have that relationship. Because, see, in Christ, one of the things we've got to learn is that we need to learn to fight for our relationships with each other more than we fight with each other. And when we learn that relationships are the most important thing, then we tend to learn how to deal with being offended, number one, or if we've offended someone, how to deal with it. Look at your passage here, because I want you to really grasp this. 
When we say we're passionate followers of Jesus Christ, that means we look to Him for everything. If we're the kind of person that gets offended easily, let's look to Jesus and see, how did Jesus handle the offenses that He was handing to Him? And the other thing about that is how do we see other people who have given us the right example, how did they handle being offended? Look at the passage that was read to you just a few moments ago. And it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's pretty interesting stuff. Jesus Christ endured the cross. Now, I, I sometimes get offended easily. You sometimes get offended easily, but how offensive is the cross? How offensive is it to be spat on? How offensive is it to be beaten for something you never did? How offensive is it to be scorned and mocked and paraded in front of people when you're innocent? But the passage says here, He endured the cross for the joy set before Him. It starts off in the first verse, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses. You see, we have a spiritual heritage. There have been people that have gone on before us. When I came to this church, one of the things that I was certain to do is to lift up the preachers that had come before me, that had started the congregation, that had been a part of the congregation, even invited them to come back and speak to the congregation, because I knew I was standing on their shoulders. And we have a cloud of witnesses that are in the Bible, and, and I won't go through the whole chapter of Hebrews 11, but I wanted to point out something down here at the bottom. It says, some face jeers and flogging. That's offensive. While still others were chained and put in prison. That's offensive. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. When they spoke, uh, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. So when I'm being offended, do I really have anything to be offended by? I've got three blanks, and the very first one is we live in a culture that is easily offended. We live in a culture that is easily offended. And I've got the Strong's Dictionary's definition of an offense because I want you to see that it's a movable stick it's a tricker or a trigger of a trap. It's a trap stick, a trap snare, an impediment placed in the way causing one to stumble or fall, a stumbling block, an occasioning of stumbling, and that is what we're talking about right now. You see, it's okay to be offended by something. If someone was to talk bad about my parents, I would be offended. But the problem is, is, are you going to be offended that you're going to fall into a trap? That young lady that I was telling you about, she was so quick to be offended that she fell into the trap of looking pretty silly. And some of us are going to get offended by something we read or something we hear or something someone says, and it's going to cause us to stumble in our walk with God. And that's what I want to get across today because we live on a higher plane than everybody else in the world. We are not of the world. My kids used to say, everybody else is doing it. And I would say to them immediately, we are not like everybody else and we will never be like everybody else because everybody else is not going to heaven. 
and we are going to heaven, we have a higher calling, we have a high priest that is in heaven waiting for us. And we have to live differently than the world. The second blank on here says the church should influence culture. And that is so true. We are the light unto the world. We should be influencing culture. We should be going out and making peace with all the things that are going on in the world. We should be the ones that show how racism cannot exist in this world. We should be the ones that are caring for people who are hurting and dying in this world. We should be the ones that are taking forgiveness and healing the hurts of the world. But here's the problem, and this is your third blank. Culture is influencing the church. And many of us are no different than the world in that we are being offended by what people are doing. I was walking down the hallway in Idaho in the hotel that I was staying in. And, and I got to tell you, I loved being in Idaho. It's, I missed you guys, but I love being there because nobody wears masks there. You go into a restaurant, there's no mask. The only people that are wearing masks are the ones holding the place up. And because of the pandemic, we just ignore them. But see, you go there and nobody's wearing masks. But the problem is, is you got people coming from California and you got people coming from Oregon and you got people from Washington State and people from, like me from Florida coming in and they're all used to wearing masks. And I'm walking down the hallway one evening and this woman points at me and says, you're not wearing a mask. And I'm looking at her thinking, you're not wearing one either. And I'm bewildered. Her husband looked at her and said, Honey, you're not wearing one either. And she goes, Oh, no. <laughs> she offended herself. <laughs> we have this culture of offense. And we're offended. I, 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 was, I went this morning because I don't have to get here as early. I went this morning to first watch and had some breakfast. I, I left Nancy getting ready. I just, I'm going to go have me some breakfast. I got to have some energy if I'm going to preach this long today. And boy, it's going to be long because I haven't even got started. <laughs> so I, I went in there and there's this young lady that's a waitress there and she's had surgery recently and she's been really sick and she was her first day back and I saw her and, and, and I got up to give her a hug, and her boss was right there and said, you can't hug her. And I thought for a minute, well, watch me. <laughs> and then I thought, well, that would be offensive. <laughs> I'm preaching on day, and I don't want to be offensive. So I didn't hug her. But he told me, he says, Neil, we got people that are calling in when we don't wear our mask right. We got people calling in if they see us doing anything improper. And I said, yep, it's the COVID Nazis. I've seen them. I've seen them. You can tell by the way they wear their mask. <laughs> they wear the full face shield. No, I'm just kidding. Don't be offended if you, please don't be offended if you wear a full face shield. <laughs> I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to be funny here, okay? <sighs> so let's get to the lesson today. Let's, I, I'm having way too much fun here today. We may never go home, okay? But here, here's our goal. We're going to help each other become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> We're going to do that through the great commandment, which is to love God and love others. We got the vertical and we got the horizontals where we're loving God and we're loving others. And then we're going to go out into the world and we're going to make disciples. Amen? This is how we're going to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to grow up in Christ. That's what I'm here is. I'm here to help you grow up. I'm hoping in the meantime I might grow up. But we're going to grow up in Christ, and that's what we want to do when it comes to being offended and being offensive. We want to grow up in Christ. And the very first thing that we're going to do is how should we live as Christians in this culture of being offended, number one, this is so important. Let me, let me just 
tell you what I did this week. This week, I talked to a lot of different people, and I asked several people this question. What is the one characteristic of being a mature Christian? What is the one characteristic? And I got all kinds of answers from all kinds of people. And, and they were all good answers. I'm not saying they were, well, I am saying they were wrong. <laughs> but I think we need to realize this is the one characteristic of being a mature Christian. And here it is in your notes. Follow the way of love. Follow the way of love. And that looks really good up here, doesn't it? Doesn't that seem real Christian-like? We're, we're, we're going to follow the way of love. Let me say it with a polite voice. Let's all follow the way of love. That right there, folks, is the hardest thing for you to do in your walk with God. But when you start doing that, that's when you know you're a mature Christian. It, you know how I can tell the babies and the adolescents and the children in the Christian is they're not following the way of love. They're following the way of my rights, my opinion, and what I want. And that's not following the way of love. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 15, 9 through 12. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Underline those words. And the reason why I want you to underline those words because your capacity to love others is based on how you accept Jesus' love for you. You ever notice that? If Nancy's not being real loving, I have a hard time being loving to her. Y'all don't believe this, but at times Nancy's not very loving. I'll go ahead and throw myself under the bus. Most of the time, I'm not very lovable. Here's the thing. We've got to find our depth of love, not in each other. We've got to love each other, but our depth of love does not come because Carl House over here treats me right. By the way, Carl's been here for a long time, and he's just now learning to wear a mask. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend you, brother. But if I expect Carl to fulfill me in my love, I, I'm going to be limited because Carl's capacity of love is limited. But you know whose capacity to love is not? God's. And look at what it says right here. As the Father, God in heaven has loved me, I have loved you. That fills us up. And then what does he say? Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed the Father's command. Remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. And look at what it says, my command. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. The greatest characteristic of a mature Christian is their capacity to love even the unlovable. It's, it's not, you know, we're, we've, I've been talking with, with people about relationships my entire life, and building relationships is not with the people that you get along with all the time. You, you can't count building relationships with the people you hang out all the time with. When we're talking about building relationships, we're talking about loving people that you wouldn't normally love. It's about making time for people you wouldn't normally make time for. It's about forgiving people who are unforgivable. I had a member last night. I just laid down. I got up Saturday morning, had to go pick up, drive, pick up Nancy, got Nancy home. I spent the entire afternoon counseling people. So about 9 o'clock last night, I was getting pretty tired. So at 
30, I laid down, and I mean I hit the bed hard at 9.30. At 9.45, one of our members called me. And if you're watching today, I forgive you and I love you. I'm just tired. That's the reason why this sermon's taking so long. <laughs> it's your fault. But the reason why I'm telling you that is because when you're tired and you're kind of over it, it's hard to be loving. Isn't it? But if you want to love like Jesus loved and you want to be mature as a Christian, you've got to love even when you don't, don't have the capacity for it. And the only way to get that capacity when you don't have it is to ask Jesus to help you. A lot of you don't even really know what love is. You, you have a Hollywood idea of love. You, oh, I look at her, she looks at me, we fall in love, and life is happily ever after. Well, let me tell you, that is a different kind of love than what we're talking about. Love is loving even when it doesn't feel right. Love is loving even when your husband is unlovable. Love is loving when your spouse is looking at you right now. Look at what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Because I want you to see this. Because when it talks about love, I just think it's great that, that Jesus defined. Jesus defined for us through the scriptures what love is. He not only defined what love is through the scriptures, but he also says this is what God's love is for you. Remember I told you about the capacity to love is based on your capacity to understand and, and accept God's love? Here's what love is. It says, love is patient. <laughs> How many of you got that one down? <laughs> love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of the wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, and it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Second thing you need to know is you need to choose to forgive and be forgiven. In order for you to make it in this world today, in order for you to be a change in the culture today, you've got to learn to choose to be forgiven and to forgive. My capacity to forgive is based on my capacity to receive forgiveness. A lot of you, the Bible has told you clearly, God has forgiven you, He's wiped away your sins, but you're still hanging on to them, and you're still living as though you're not forgiven. We need to be living as though we are being forgiving. And when we live that way, it's going to make it easier for us to forgive other people. Amen? But we've got to learn to accept God's forgiveness in order to forgive other people. In other words, if you are holding on to a grudge right now, one of the things I would ask you to do is to go to God in prayer and say, God, what is it that I feel like you, ha you have not forgiven? What is going on in my life that I cannot forgive myself of so that I can forgive others? You've got to accept God's forgiveness, and then you've got to live in that forgiveness. A lot of us are living, but we're not living in that forgiveness. I heard a great story of, uh, it was a preacher, it was a friend of mine, and he was telling me about when his son was like 12 years old or something. And his son had just lied up a storm to him. 
And he's telling me the story, and he's saying, you know, Neil, I know I shouldn't reason with a teenager or a 12-year-old. He said, but man alive, I was so hot, and I was, he said, I just gave him what for. And he says, after about a 30-minute lecture, this kid looked at him, and he said, Dad, I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And he'd been teaching his kid right. And he said, you know what? I said, yes, son, I forgive you. And I went on to the church, and I did ministry for the day. And I came home, and I took my shower, and I'm sitting up in bed. And this 12-year-old boy came up, and he jumped in the bed with me. And when he jumped in the bed with me, he had his book that he wanted to read. And he snuggled right up next to me, and he put his arm in my arm, and he was humming And he says, and I just sat there and I was still mad. And I looked at my son and he says, what are you so happy about? He said, what do you mean, Dad? He said, don't you remember lying to me this morning? Don't you remember doing all this stuff and the fight we had this morning? He says, yeah, Dad, but you forgave me. And he said, this 12-year-old boy taught me more about living in forgiveness than I had learned in my whole life. Because he asked for forgiveness and then didn't ask to come into the room, didn't ask to get in the bed, didn't ask if he could snuggle up with Dad. He believed what Dad said about his forgiveness and accepted it. And he learned quickly how to live in forgiveness. How many of you in here, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I already know the answer. How many of you in here have screwed up this week? How many of you have screwed up since you've been here? <laughs> it's, it's an easy thing to do, but when you ask for forgiveness and you start back over, we should live in though the slate has been clean. And I want you to look, Colossians, I'm running way out of time here. I did take down the clock in here, and my watch has quit like a half hour ago, so it doesn't matter. So anyway, it says here in, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. If you're married and you've been married for more than a day, you're going to be offended. If you're a member of this church and it's been more than five minutes, you're going to be offended. If you're my friend, or better yet, if you're Jeff Stevens' friend, you're going to be offended. Jeff, Jeff says he's an equal opportunity offender. That's his, that's his thing. That's his thing. And that's why I love Jess, because he will offend anybody at any time. And, and I, I know he doesn't really mean that he cares, he doesn't care, but, but sometimes it looks like he doesn't. But, but the point being is if you're going to be in this world, you're going to be offended, and you need to forgive whatever grievances you have against each other. And you need to bear with those that are having a hard time. You need to be somebody that loves others. And the final thing here, number three, or this isn't the final, it's just number three. I'm, I'll tell you when I'm done, okay? <laughs> just pay attention. We need to walk in God's wisdom. And this has just kind of jumped off the page to me like I have never seen before after coming back from being out in Idaho. And, and I know Tim's doing a study on James but one of the things that's just really jumping off of the page as I'm reading my Bible right now is it's all about the relationships. And you want wisdom, and a lot of us will pray for wisdom, and we want 
worldly wisdom. We want to know what to do about our job, what to do about different things. I've had conversations with my sons about wisdom and how to decide things. But if you want wisdom, you need to go to the source of wisdom, and that's godly wisdom. And look at what it says here in James. Who, who is wise and understanding among you? By, uh, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his work in meekness of wisdom. But if you have, now look at this. If you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambitions in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above. But look at this. It is earthly. It is unspiritual it's demonic that's that's just pretty pretty bold statement James you're saying when when, when I, I am jealous what, what, what do you mean wait a minute when I see somebody driving up in a new vehicle when, when I see somebody getting something that I don't have what, what, James, what are, you, what are you talking about here, James? That, that, uh, yeah, I, I can say it's earthly, but unspiritual? Oh, come on, James, don't go too far. It's demonic when I boast or false to the truth. And look at what it says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And then he goes on to say, this is what wisdom is. You want to know what wisdom is? You want to know how to be wise in this world? It, it, it comes with relationships. He says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. You, you can trust me because I don't have any evil motive. I'm, I'm not looking out for me. I'm looking out for both of us. Or maybe I'm just looking out for you. And then it's peaceable. I'm, I'm not going to try to have a war with you. I'm gentle. I'm, I, I'm open to reason. I, I, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to seek first to understand and then to be understood. I, I'm going to be full of mercy and good fruits. I'm going to be impartial and sincere. And then he says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You want to be wise in this world? Be wise in your relationships. Three things here. You've got to follow the way of love. You've got to choose to forgive and be forgiven. And you're going to have to walk in God's wisdom. You do those three things right there, you're not going to be easily offended. And if you are offended, you're not going to make it in a trap. You're not, it's not going to be stumbling block to you you're not going to come in and hate your brother and your sister because they have a different political view or they put something on facebook that you don't like by the way i still don't have facebook and i'm so glad right now because i, I gotta tell you at least twice a week i hear something about facebook that makes me cringes cringe and sometimes it, it's it's my members that are putting it out there Somebody reports you. And, and here's, here's what happens. If you want to report somebody to Facebook, your Facebook police, you want to report somebody. I haven't seen it, so I can't address it. So I just said, well, would you go and talk to that person about that? That's not right. And seems how you saw it. Would you go and talk to them? And, and I think that's probably where it ends. But if you walk in wisdom in your relationships, you'll love people, you'll forgive and be forgiven. You will start to become the passionate follower of Jesus Christ. The very final thing is commit, be committed to becoming a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Be committed to becoming a fat, passionate follower of Jesus Christ. I, the reason why, I, I, you probably say, Neil, we've heard this before, I don't want to hear it again, but the reason why I keep saying it is because so many of us 
feel like that if we attend on Sunday mornings, we get just enough Bible knowledge to make it dangerous, and, and we know what's right and we know what's wrong, then we're okay, and God loves us, and, you know, I'm not as bad as, 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 as Carl House. Carl, you, you are now my best friend because I'm picking on you all the time. My other best friend moved around away, so you have to become my best friend now. So I, I can look and say, well, you know, I'm not nearly as bad as Carl. I'm not nearly bad as such and such. And so I'm okay. But God called us to something higher. And this got cut off your notes, but I, I think it's on the next slide. If we want to change the culture, we must be committed by changing ourselves. If we want to change the culture, we must be committed to changing ourselves. All of us in this room have seen something on the news or seen something going on in the world, and we think that's not right, we need to change it. But the beginning of changing the world is for us to change ourselves. And when we have a church that is committed to becoming passionate followers of Jesus Christ, we will be able to stand here in this auditorium and look out into the world and see the difference that this church is making. And I didn't come here to loot to County Line Road because I like the drive from my house. I came here because I thought this was the place that God would change the world. But we have to be committed to it as individuals. I don't know where you are in your walk with God, but we offer an invitation on Sunday morning, and that invitation is for you to come and ask for the prayers of the church, to rededicate your life to Christ, to be that passionate follower of Jesus Christ that you need to be. You may be here and you've lost your, uh, your vigor. You've lost your, your energy for being that person. You may be here and you've got sin that's, that's just holding you down, keeping you from being what you need to be. Or you may be here and you know that you need to accept Jesus Christ as not only your Savior but also your Lord. And you're going to start that by being obedient to Him through baptism. This invitation song is not just for one person. It's for every person in this room. When, when I sing an invitation song, I sing it to myself. And I sing it to you because I want us all to be encouraged to take the next steps to being what Christ calls us to be. The lesson is yours as we stand and sing.